Okay, so let me let me focus on the elastic spring force right now. Okay, keyword is this piece: how much an object is stretched or compressed affects your elastic spring force. Okay, take note. So the length of the spring, I believe you guys know, is the original length plus the extension. Okay, take note. Look at your graph. Did the question give you extension? Or is it the length of the spring? It makes a difference, okay? So when you don't add anything, okay, the, there will be, it won't start off with zero because the length of the spring, I mean, the, it will, there will be a length, all right, Ken? So how do we determine how elastic an object is? We find out the extension. We found how much the spring extend by, okay, Ken? So always add on, you know, which one is more elastic? You have to always, you know, compare it for the same mass of. This is always missing out in your answer for the same mass of weight or load, hand or both, and then which one extended more? Okay, can you need to know how to identify between a spring that is fully stretched, okay, versus overstretched, okay? So for instance, in this case, this is length of the spring. Take note, length of the spring is the original length plus the extension. So look at here, when it's stretching, right, when the mass of the load added is zero, my mass, the, the length of the spring is, is, is not zero because without adding anything, without adding anything, that, that, that there's a length, right? Okay, the spring is of a certain length. All right, so fully stretched. Uh, compression won't be here, Amos, okay? Now, when it's compressed, right, the length gets shorter. Okay, so in this case, this would be the one that is fully stretched. See, has reached its maximum, fully stretched already. Now, it cannot go back to its original length already. So in this case, it will have been overstretched. Okay, all these are found in your forces notes. Ah, huh? overstretch. Spring will not return to its original length after the weights or loads are removed. So I believe right now at this point, some guys are very familiar with the three rules of magnetism. Magnetism can act at a distance, there's no need for contact, no need for contact. Can pass us through non-magnetic materials, your, you attract your magnetic materials, you should know your, your steel, iron, nickel, cobalt. Okay, so anyway, why the math tip can remain floating in the air, okay, why? Okay, this, okay so there's a, a simple example, your magnet, your paper tip, your, your paper tip definitely must be a magnetic material. Okay, in this case, you have your non-magnetic material because magnetism can pass through non-magnetic material. Am I right? Correct, correct. Okay, so it applies, you know, root, second rule. Okay, so this shows why the paper tape can float. Okay, so it does satisfy all the three rules of magnetism. It acts at a distance. There's no need for contact. It's able to attract your paper tape. Your paper tape must be a magnetic material. Non-magnetic material, which is your paper. 